we can face them all. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. That was a blessing. Amen. Love it. If you have your Bibles with you here today, we are going to a new place. Going to the second letter. Paul to the Thessalonians. As you all know, we just came out of 1 Thessalonians. Right. Some of our brothers say 1 Thessalonians. Right. But now we are in 2 Thessalonians. And today, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. Right. And I'm going to take the liberty this Lord's Day to... Read the first five verses from the NASB. So if you have that, just signal by just simply saying amen. 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 I'll begin reading. Paul and Silas, or Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and Peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We ought to always give thanks to God for you, mm -hmm. brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged. The love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Mm -hmm. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Amen. 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 You may be pre uh, seated in the presence of the Lord. And the tag we're going to add on this text for this Lord's Day is just simply growing through adversity. Amen. This will be part one. Growing through adversity, part one. Beloved, when a child is born, when a family experiences the natural birth of a new addition to their family, there is much excitement. Mm -hmm. There is excitement about the possibilities for this young child. There is expectations for this young child. And whenever a young child is born into a family, the expectation is, is that this child would be growing. As a matter of fact, when Families have a new child added to their family, a baby added to their family. There will be doctor's appointments. And the purpose of these doctor's appointments is to ensure that this child is, in fact, growing. And so just as there are expectations that come with physical birth, what we need to know today is there are expectations when it comes to our spiritual birth. Yes, as a child who is physically born grows and develops through different stages of life, as we are born again spiritually, we should be growing through the different phases of our lives. Beloved, no one ought to stay the same way they were when they first got saved. Or when we were first converted, there ought to be this expectation of growth. So when God saves us, God even expects that his followers, those who serve him and follow him, will be growing. Mm -hmm. 
God not only expects growth, but, but God produces growth in us. Because God doesn't want us to suffer from arrested development. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to suffer from spiritual malnourishment or spiritual undevelopment. So God commands that we be growing. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the, the, the apostle Peter puts it this way. He says, but grow the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to spiritual growth, what we need to understand as followers of Christ is what growth is and what growth is not. And growing spiritually, beloved, isn't about memorizing facts about Jesus. Because how many of us in here today know that the devil knows facts about Jesus? But the devil will not follow Jesus. The devil will not serve Jesus. There are many unbelievers that know facts about Jesus, but the unbelievers who know facts about Jesus do not submit to Jesus' authority or follow him as Lord and Savior. So growing spiritually is not just about knowing and memorizing facts. Well, but the facts, the truths that we know about Jesus have to be transforming us into his image. Not only this, growing spiritually isn't about being a Christian for a long period of time. Because there are many a Christian who have been a Christian for a long period of time, but they are still, spiritually speaking, infants. Yeah, as we say, they still own milk and not own meat. And listen, beloved, the greatest tragedy, I believe, in the Christian life is, is this. It's, it's not that we become a Christian at a young age and die. Well. I believe the greatest tragedy or one of the greatest tragedies in the Christian faith or Christian life is to become a Christian mm -hmm. and live a Christian for a very long time. Live as a Christian for a very long time and never grow. Mm -hmm. Come on. Never grow in their spiritual journey to become fully mature adults in the faith. So becoming spiritually mature in the faith is crucial. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's, it's, it's critical. If we want our position in Christ to match our practice, if we want our orthodoxy to match our orthopraxy. Spiritual growth is crucial. Mm. So beloved, we have to be in the pursuit of holiness. Well. We must be pressing toward the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must be putting on righteousness as a breast. Come on, come on. So these things must be done simultaneously as we're growing through our various adversities in life. And notice, beloved, I didn't say go through mm -hmm. adversity. I said grow through adversity because everybody here and under the sound of my voice is going through some form of adversity here, there, or in some form of that, that is challenging them. But we, instead of just simply and merely going through our adversity, mm -hmm. we have to use our adversities that occur in our lives to help us grow. Right. So when we look at this young church here, these <laughs> verses before us, this young church is a model, serves as a model church as to how we as followers of Christ can continue to grow through our adversity. Well, because this church, when it was founded, wasn't just surviving in a culture that was hostile to their faith. This church was thriving 
in a culture that was hostile to their faith. If you recall, this church was established on the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. There was the Apostle Paul, there was Silas or Silvanius, as the text says before us in verse 1, and then there was Timothy. Mm -hmm. And Acts chapter 17 tells us about the story of the founding of the church at Thessalonica. If you recall, Paul was only there for a short period of time, and he wasn't able to stay long, and the reason he wasn't able to stay long at Thessalonica is because as soon as he began to preach the gospel, he began to experience adversity. And how many of us know that as soon as you began to preach the gospel, as soon as you began to start living your life for the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to experience some adversity. As a matter of fact, I would put forward today as a proposition that if you are not experiencing some adversity because you are living your faith before a watching world for the Lord Jesus Christ, I think that is a reason for you to question your faith. Because Jesus has not called us to be comfortable. So this, immerse, this adversity that this young church was facing Ended up resulting in the Apostle Paul being ran out of town. And after a few, after, after a brief moment of time, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to check on this particular church to see if they were holding up under the persecution, under the adversity that they were facing. Well. And so Paul came back and he gave, oh, Timothy came back rather and gave Paul a Good report. Mm -hmm. And what Paul did is, is he sent a letter that we just came out of, 1 Thessalonians, back to this young church at Thessalonica to help them to hang on in there until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But yet within a few months, mm -hmm. trouble began to arise again. Adversity began to arise again. All sorts of distress began to arise again. There were more issues that Paul needed to address, and so word got back to him. Mm -hmm. And the question that people may be asking this morning is, what issues had arisen that caused the Apostle Paul to address, to have to address these issues again through 2 Thessalonians? Well. Love, there were issues concerning, again, adversity mm -hmm. because they were being persecuted. And I'm sure some of them, like some of us, have the same question. If I'm a Christian, why is God allowing me to suffer? Come on. Or better yet, if I'm a Christian, why hasn't God done something mm -hmm. about what it is that I'm going through? Doesn't he see me in pain? Doesn't he see the trouble that I'm going through? Yes, sir. Doesn't God understand that I'm hurting in this particular predicament that I'm in? And, and if he knows this, why has he not done something? Amen, amen. Again, beloved, there were issues concerning the arrival or second coming of Jesus. Apparently there was this letter that had been circulating from some false teacher wow. saying that... Uh, the day of the Lord had already come. Mm -hmm. Come on. So it caused confusion in this young church because can you imagine if somebody sent a letter around to all the churches and they were saying, listen, Jesus then already came back again. Mm -hmm. Y'all missed it. Mm. That would cause a lot of confusion. Right. Then there were issues concerning apostasy, this uh, falling away. And we need to understand something about uh, apostasy, this falling away. Those who fall away, beloved, were not are saved to begin with. Come on, yeah. come on. Yes. But then there were issues concerning the Antichrist, his satanic signs and wonders that he was doing in that particular, or performing in that particular community. And then finally, there was this issue of apathy. This issue of apathy within this community of believers. And, and there were some individuals who had developed an attitude that said, well, since Jesus is coming back, mm -hmm. I don't need to work. 
And the Apostle Paul simply responded by saying, if you don't work, you will not eat. Mm -hmm. So Paul wrote to exhort this young congregation to grow through this adversity. He wrote this second letter of the Thessalonians to this young congregation to hang on in there. Amen. In the Amen. midst of their adversity. And I want to let some of you all know today to be encouraged and hang on in there in the midst of your adversity. Yes, sir. Right. We look at these verses that are before us today. Beloved, I believe there's at least five. There probably could be more, but we'd be here all night, you know. <laughs> there are at least five truths which I believe can aid us as we grow through our adversity. Mm -hmm. and number one is if we are going to grow through our adversity, the foundation of our salvation must be in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Two, if we going to grow through our adversity. Our faith must be growing because uh, I once heard a preacher by the name of Steve Lawson say, faith that fizzles, that fizzles out before the finish mm -hmm. was faulty from the start. Come on. Three, if we are to grow through our adversity, Love for one another has to be flourishing. Mm, my God. For if we are to grow through our adversity, we must be faithful and resist the temptation to become faint-hearted. Mm. Because when you are being pressed in on all sides, when you feel like you are discouraged, depressed, despondent because of the adversities that you are facing in your life. They have a way of making us feel faint-hearted. It makes us feel like we want to throw in the towel. Come on, teach us. Five, if we are going to advance through our adversity, we have to remain kingdom-focused. Mm -hmm. We've got to remain kingdom-focused. So, beloved, as we work our way, trek our way through these particular verses, these five verses of Scripture, I want it would be helpful. And I would like to say that we should hang our thoughts on these five F words. Foundation, faith, flourishing, faithful, and focus. But listen, beloved, again, the, their, their foundation, the foundation of their salvation was grounded in their union with God the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if we look at verse 1 right here, it Paul's greeting, his greeting in verses 1 and 2 of this particular letter is very similar to the greeting that Paul made in second, uh, in 1 Thessalonians, rather, 1 and 1. So this greeting here in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2 is very similar to the greeting that Paul put forth in 1 Thessalonians. And so in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1, Paul wrote Paul, Silas, and Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. But then here in our text in 2 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, Paul writes, Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice the difference? Did you notice the difference in the preposition? There was one preposition that was, uh, that was missing in 1 Thessalonians in the greeting, and there was a preposition that was added in 2 Thessalonians. And, and Paul inserts the word our in the greeting in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And so this insertion of the word our makes this, these particular verses all the more sweet. 
Well, yes, yes. They, they, they make a sweet difference when it comes to our foundation, the foundation of our salvation because of our union that is grounded in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you're talking about a high view of God here in the first two verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 because the, the Father is God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Jesus, beloved, is not just a God with a little g. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Just as the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God. And so we affirm this as the Holy Trinity. And so in, in 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, the emphasis was on God being the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in the greeting in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in the first two verses, the focus is on God the Father being our Father. Do you see that? Our Father, which was or is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a unique distinctive for the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. It's what sets us apart from the other faiths that are in the world or the other religions that are in the world because when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ God becomes our father Come on. so our God is not an impersonal deity he is the God of scripture mm -hmm. yes who has revealed himself in creation, reveal himself in the Old Testament, yeah. reveal himself in the New Testament. And so, yes, there is a sense with, in which God, our Father, mm -hmm. yes, is, is, is the Father in a fatherly sense of all creation yeah. because of, of his divine providence. He allows the sun to shine on the just yeah. as well as the, the unjust. Yet, beloved, we've got to be affirmative here. Mm -hmm. We've got to draw a line in the sand yeah, here right. and be willing to boldly stand and say that he is only the father mm -hmm. in a salvific sense of those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. His Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father, mm -hmm. who is in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yeah. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So we can cry out to God, our Father, Abba, Father, because we have received the adoption that comes, or spiritual adoption that comes by way of the Holy Spirit through faith. So as a result of this union, with God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You look closely again at the text again in verses 1 and 2. We, we receive two blessings. I mean, God has many more blessings to give us, but there are at least two identified here. Mm -hmm. and those blessings are grace and peace. Mm -hmm. And grace, y'all know what grace is. Grace is more than what you say over your food <laughs> at the dinner table. Yeah, grace comes from God as a free gift. It's God's unmerited favor. Grace is coming to the realization that uh, I don't even deserve to be saved. Amen. Because of my sin, all I deserve is the wrath of God. Yes, sir. Instead of God giving me wrath, he gives me grace. Oh, yes, that's a blessing, y'all. Yeah. See, and oftentimes, before we can know God's amazing grace, we have, we, we've got to be astounded by how greater God's grace is than our sin. Good. Mm -hmm. 
God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Amen. Paul not only mentions grace, he mentions peace. God's peace is the kind of peace that comes about as a result of God's grace. And when we think of God's peace, we need to think of God's peace with the mindset of having peace with God. And peace with God only comes through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But not only should we think of peace with God, we should think about the peace of God. Oh yes, the peace of God is, is not the absence of conflict in your life. It's not the absence of adversity in your life. The peace of God is the peace that you have in Christ Jesus yeah, yeah. amidst the adversity that you are experiencing in your life. It's the kind of peace that transcends all our understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. As Paul told the saints at Philippi, he said, don't be anxious about anything, mm -hmm. but in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request unto God. He said, by supplication and thanksgiving. I missed that part. Present your request unto God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. So, the peace of God comes only through Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it this way in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And when I give it to you, I don't give it to you as the world gives Amen. it to you. And so as Christians, we should never tire of talking about the fatherhood yeah. of God. We should never tire about talking about our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We should never tire of mentioning the grace of God and the peace of God. For when you know that you are a, a, a son of the, or a child of the Father, and you know that you are in fellowship with his Son, and when you know that you've got his grace and his mercy yeah, upon your yeah. life, you will begin to that we face in this life by which the that they can separate us rather from the love of God that is Jesus. in Christ Jesus Amen. our Lord. Amen. And so it's foundational. Word. It's foundational if we are to grow through our adversity. And yet, beloved, as we grow through our adversity, our faith must be growing. All right. Because if you look at the first part of verse 3, Paul said, We ought to always give thanks to God for you, brethren. It is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged. Paul gave thanks to God because their faith was growing. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Their faith was growing. Their membership role may not have been growing, <laughs> but their faith was growing. Their buildings may not have been growing, mm -hmm. but their faith was growing. Their nickels may not have been growing, but their faith yeah. was growing. Beloved, two times, too many times, rather, we, we measure growth by the wrong thing. Right. You can have a building a mile wide and it only be an inch deep. That's right. Because nobody grow. Nobody's growing in their faith. But this church, this young church, was growing, growing greatly. Because greatly enlarged means they were growing in abundance. Mm -hmm. Spiritually speaking. They were like trees planted by the rivers of water. That yields its fruit in its season. This wasn't faith in faith. This is faith in God, lest we forget. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things 
not seen. Faith believes that God is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Faith is trusting in the power of God. Because we understand there's nothing too hard for our God. Yeah. Faith trusts in the promises of God yeah. because we understand that our God is not a man that he should lie yeah. nor a son of man that he yeah. should change yeah. his mind. Our God does not promise and not fulfill. Every promise that our God makes, he's going to bring it yeah. to pass. Thank you, Lord. And so, like this young church, we need to be growing in our faith. Not only this, asking the Lord, if your faith is, is, is little, you got small faith, then say, Lord, increase my faith. Amen. Amen. Lord, increase my faith. Because the truth of the matter is, is from time to time, although our faith may be strong in the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, from time to time, because of the adversity in our lives, sometimes our faith may be high, sometimes it may be low. Amen. And so when our faith is low, Lord, I need a little bit more Jesus. Amen. As a matter of fact, Lord, I know I got all the Jesus that I need, but I need you to increase my faith that Jesus is going to see me through this. So Paul, thank God for their growing faith because it was Paul's duty mm -hmm. to thank God. Because he was the one who was causing the growth in the first place. Amen. So his thanking God for them encouraged them to hold up mm -hmm. under these challenges that they were facing. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but somebody needs to hold up, yes, hold on to God's unchanging hand Amen. through these challenges that are in front of you. Hold on. Let go. Beloved, growing in our faith through adversity isn't just about learning to live. But watch this. It's about also learning to die. Mm -hmm. I had to have a, a test a couple weeks ago, and uh, that hit me right in the gut that my faith in Christ is not about. Me learning to live in the mm -hmm. present. But it's also about me learning to die. Right. Let me ask you today, do you know how to die? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to die? Do you know how to die of your sinful desires? And then when it comes time for the Lord to call you home. Come on, come on. Do you know how to die? Do you know how to die in the Lord trusting him to the end? Yeah. Recognizing that the grave does not have the final say. Yeah. After my stammering tongue has stopped, mm -hmm. one day he's going to break me out of that grave and my tongue that was once stammering will be able to praise his yeah. name. So, another question we should ask ourselves in this vein is, is are we ready to die? Mm. Are you ready to die? Because there are far too many of us, we plan, see? Mm. And we're not ready to die. Right. We think we got all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. God could call our number today. That's right. Yeah. And if he calls your number today, are you ready? He's ready. So, Paul, Silas, and Timothy gave thanks for their growth. You know, we ought to give thanks for the growth that we see in people amongst us. Mm -hmm. Come on, dog. Because we understand, beloved, that there is absolutely no circumstance that we face in this life in which we cannot thank God for. Amen. Amen. In other words, in our trials, yeah. give thanks. Amen. In our troubles, give thanks. Mm -hmm. In our triumphs, give thanks. When we experience trauma, mm -hmm. give thanks. Yeah. When we experience what appears to us to be a tragedy, because with God, I believe there are ultimately no tragedies in this life, but when we experience something that appears to be a tragedy to us. Mm -hmm. 
we still ought to give thanks. For I'm reminded that Paul told this congregation in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So when we are growing through adversity, our faith has to be growing. But not only should our faith be growing, but our love should be flourishing. Good. Still in verse 3 here, in the second part of verse 3, it says, And the love of each one of, your, each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Their faith was growing. The love was growing alongside of their faith. Good. This was as they were going or growing through adversity. And faith and love, these two of three cardinal, great cardinal virtues of the Christian faith, along with hope. Y'all remember what Paul told the saints in Corinth, right? He said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he said, uh, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so when it comes to faith and love, our faith looks upward. Our love looks around us. See, faith is always measured by how well we are loving. Come on. Because we can always tell how much faith a person has based upon how much they love. Mm -hmm. And so the evidence of our faith, mm -hmm. that our faith is real, is if we have love for one another. Right. And this wasn't a secular kind of love either. This was sacrificial, agape kind of love. Biblical love, y'all, is a sacrificial love. Biblical love is even the kind of love that makes us love our enemies. Well, you know, we're always talking about love, but we're only talking about really loving folks who love us back, right? Yeah. But, but Jesus said, love your enemies. So their love was flourishing. This is the kind of love that Jesus put the emphasis on the night of his arrest, the night of his betrayal. In the 13th chapter of John, Jesus said by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, and that is if you have love for one another. And so the church ought to be a place where love is most readily visible. It was Philip Yancey who once said in an article that he did for Christianity Today, why I don't go to a mega church. He made this distinction between a club and a church. He said, a club is where you go to hang around people that you want to hang around with. Mm -hmm. He said, a church, on the other hand, is like a community because in a community, there are people who we least like to hang around <laughs> with. And you understand, beloved, anybody can form a club. All you got to do is set up some rules Membership rules, have folk pay some dues, and you're a part of the club. That's probably the reason why I'm not an active member of a fraternal organization anymore, because I don't believe in paying to have friends. <laughs> but a church, on the other hand, is more like a community. In a community, it takes sacrificial love. Yeah, if you're going to make a community work, folk got to love one another as themselves. Yeah. And they got to love one another as Christ loved the church. And so, beloved, if we are to grow through our adversity, we have to be faithful 
by resisting the temptation to become faint-hearted. Look at verse 4. He says, therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions mm -hmm. which you endure. They remained faithful by resisting the temptation <laughs> to become faint-hearted. And this caused Paul to speak proudly about them to the other churches of God throughout that particular world at the time. Because understand, when Paul wrote this letter to them, he was not in Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul was in Corinth. And so wherever Paul went to teach the gospel, there was always going to be some persecution. Right. I mean, with, Paul, with the Apostle Paul, the meeting didn't get started right until people start picking up rocks and walking <laughs> stone. Mm -hmm. So when he mentions the churches of God... What he's speaking to, beloved, is a shared adversity. A shared adversity. And a shared adversity is powerful. Right. It's, it's powerful. And what we don't often understand in our hemisphere is that there are churches around the world who are undergoing Christianity, their faith in Christ at a very costly price. Mm -hmm. I mean, even up in places like Canada now, I was reading of a pastor who was put in jail because he opened up his church during this pandemic. In places like China, there's a pastor I read about in China who's been in prison for nine years. Because he wants to preach the gospel of Christ. And so what we need to understand is that the church, although we don't see it much here, but it's coming. The church is a persecuted church yeah. in many parts of the world, and it is costly. But listen, it's a shared adversity. A shared adversity because... Our hearts are to feel something for our brothers and sisters who are experiencing that type of persecution for their faith. Well. And so our shared adversity is encouragement for our faith. Not only is it encouragement, but shared adversity enables us to become resilient when we feel discouraged. Come on, come on. Just think, when one person in this body, in this local church here, becomes sick, becomes uh, in a situation to where they need the help of the saints, it becomes shared adversity because we grieve with those who are grieving. We weep with those who are weeping. We Mm -hmm. share that burden, that adversity with them. And that shared adversity enables us to comfort that particular brother or sister in Christ. But not only this, beloved, shared adversity enables us to endure together in the midst of our troubles. And so when we have shared adversity, we may get knocked down. Come on, come on. But we all won't get knocked down. That's right. Yes, because a three-strand cord is not easily broken. Mm -hmm. Finally, beloved, if we are to grow through our adversity, it's important for us to remain kingdom-focused. Look with me at verse 5. The text says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering as we're growing through adversity. It's often difficult to see how God is using our adverse circumstances 
to accomplish his greater purpose in us and for his glory. But there are two words I want us to look at closely in this text, and that is plain indication. Plain indication is two words in our text, but in the Greek is just simply one word. And the words plain indication is evidence or proof of God's righteous judgment. It's evidence of the righteous judgment of God. There's two observations about this I, I think we need to keep in mind in verse 5. And one is God is righteous. And, and two is God's judgment is righteous because our God is righteous. So when I look at verse 5, and I understand, I'm, I'm familiar with the arguments as to whether or not verse 5 fits with verses 1 to 4, or whether or not verse 5 fits with verses 6 and 10. But I take the position that verse 5 is transitory, and it also looks back and it looks forward at the same time because uh, of the plain, or what he says in the text, the plain indication of God's righteous judgment. So when we are going through affliction, when we are experiencing persecution, it's a part of God's righteous judgment who uses what God, what we go through as a means for his own sovereign purpose. Amen. Let me explain it to you this way. I, I looked and I studied Psalm 66 and 10 and it just opened it up for me. Because in Psalm 66 and 10, it provides insight on how God uses our pain, mm -hmm. uses our persecution, uses our adversity for his own sovereign purpose. Listen, Psalm 66 and 10 says it this way. He says, for you, O God, tested us, refined us like silver. And you all know the imagery of refinement. It's something that we see throughout the, the pages of Scripture. And God is the refiner. Mm -hmm. We are the silver. And sometimes God has to put us in the fire yeah. in order for us to come or be what God has purposed us to be. Come on. Yeah, sometimes he's got to get the dross out of our lives. And beloved, we may not always be able to see it. Amen. But God is using our pain. He's using the persecution that we're going through for his purpose. He uses our pain, our adversity to make us pure. He uses our pain to show us his purpose. Our pain and our persecution, our adversity are, are working out of the purpose of God in and through our lives. Amen. Let's understand, beloved, there is, uh, there's no pain that you or I experience in this life that can prevent or stop the purpose of God from being fulfilled in you. Amen. Do you Amen. believe that Amen. today? Amen. See, through God's providential care for us, yes, all things really do work together for the good That's of right. them yeah. who love God. For those who have been called according to his purpose, even though daily things may not be good. Yeah. Yes, beloved, I believe that God is able Amen. to bring good even out of the bad yes. that we experience in life for his purpose. Yes. Oh, yes. I believe, as Thomas Watson once said, that a sick bed can often teach us more than a sermon. Yeah. Oh, yes. Adversity is a barrier from our point of view in life because we only see life one snapshot at a time. But adversity from God's viewpoint, it 
Because God doesn't just see one snapshot at a time. Our God sees the big picture. He sees the panoramic view. And so our adversity that we experience in life is just a means for God to bless us and bring good to us. Because I believe that uh, the bad that we experience in life is really his blessings can turn out to be his blessings in disguise. Mm -hmm. so, I wish I could call Amen. the woman Amen. and call Joseph in here. Amen. Call Job mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. And they would tell you that God can use evil mm -hmm. to bring good to us. So this is the reason why I say that uh, in verse 5, those words right here in verse 5, plain indication of looking back and looking forward. And not only this, but this word right here, considered worthy. It's in verse 5, considered worthy. This word, considered worthy, is found three places in the New Testament. It's one word in Greek, found three places in the New Testament. Luke 20, 35. Acts 5, 41, and this text right here in verse 5. And in particular, Acts 5, chapter 5, you need to read that. Because in Acts chapter 5, it describes what was going on in the church in the early days. And there was persecution. And the backdrop to Acts chapter 5, verse 41, is what happened when the apostles were told not to preach in the name of Jesus. You got to understand, they were thrown in jail and told not to preach in the name of Jesus. Yet they had the strength in uh, the strength of faith to say that we've got to obey God more than we obey man. Mm -hmm. They refused to stop preaching in the name of Jesus even after being flogged. The Bible says that the apostles in Acts chapter 5 went on their way rejoicing. 541 that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Mm -hmm. You missed that. Did you catch that? They considered the persecution, the adversity that they experienced. They considered it worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. What the high council thought was a barrier, God was working it out for a blessing. Yeah, yeah. You know why? They considered it worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. It was all in their kingdom focus, y'all. Their kingdom focus. They were kingdom focused amidst their adversity. And we too must remain kingdom focused, advancing the kingdom amidst our adversity because we understand ultimately who we, who, who we serve. That's all right. We're serving our king Come on. because the word kingdom is there and every kingdom must have a king. Every kingdom has to have a king and our king uses the best things. Our king uses the worst things mm -hmm. for our good and for his glory. Our king uses all our successes. Yes, he does. Our king uses all of our failures. Yes. He uses all your pain, all of our adversity for our good and for his glory. Yes, our king is the king of kings. Yes, he is. Yes, he is, and the Lord of lords. Uh -huh. Our king is the only king immortal. Our king, he is the king that is able to keep us from falling. Yeah. A king who is able to present us as faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Our king 
is the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, yes. who is strong and mighty. Oh, yes, he is mighty in battle. So lift up your hands, oh, he gets. And be lifted up the everlasting doors. Because the king of glory wants to come in. Who is this king of glory? Yeah. The Lord oh. Almighty. Yeah. He is the king of yeah. glory. Jesus yeah. is the king of glory. Yes, because he's the king of glory, he's worthy of all the glory. He's yeah. worthy of all the praise. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord he is to be praised. Yes. Yes. All hail, King Jesus. Yes. All hail, Emmanuel. Because he's reigning yes. forever. Yes. Let everything that has right. breath praise the Lord. Right on, King Jesus. Yes. <laughs> yes, Amen. Beloved, we got to grow through our adversity. Amen. And Word. the Lord is to be praised. Yes, Word. Yes. Word. Perhaps there may be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And as we say each week, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if someone wants to learn more about what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, come see me out of service. And I'll do my best to explain the plan of salvation. With that said, let us get our hearts and minds prepared to sing our closing.